Good afternoon, and welcome to the Cato Institute. My name is Tim Lynch, and I'm the director of Cato's Project on Criminal Justice. Today we have uh, two gentlemen from the right side of the political spectrum that are going to be uh, debating the question of whether civil liberties are at risk in the war on terror, or more precisely, the war that we are involved in against the Al-Qaeda terrorist network. Before I introduce our first debater, I would like to take just a minute or two to lay something of a foundation for this afternoon's discussion. But before I do that, I want to ask those of you with cell phones to please double check them and to make sure that they are turned off uh, as a courtesy to uh, our speakers. <laughs> you, you Thank you. Over the past five years, there have been more than a few controversies uh, with respect to civil liberties and the Bill of Rights. Uh, we don't have enough time today to get them all covered adequately, but I'm going to mention just a few so that we can uh, keep the big picture perspective in mind as we uh, get into some of them here in the debate. First, of course, shortly after 9-11, we had the Patriot Act and the expansion of the use in national security letters. We had uh, the Total Information Awareness Program that was put forward by Admiral John Poindexter. There was the establishment of the Guantanamo Bay uh, prison facility and uh, later the revelations about secret CIA black sites and uh, the leaking of the torture memos. This summer we're going to see trials before military tribunals instead of trials in civilian courts, proceedings that we haven't seen since the end of World War II. And then there's the National Security Agency and its surveillance of telephone conversations, uh, telephone records, and uh, surveillance of email. And finally, uh, well, this list isn't exhaustive, but uh, one other one important one that needs to be mentioned is the enemy combatant controversy, where we've had Americans uh, locked up in military brigs and uh, deprived of access to civilian lawyers and the claim to, that's made that they can't even have access to the civilian court system uh, by use of the uh, great writ of habeas corpus. This is the Jose Padilla controversy and Yasser Hamdi, the enemy combatant controversy. Now, Attorney General uh, Alberto Gonzalez has been one of the key players in proposing these policies. And he, of course, has been under fire lately on Capitol Hill. Uh, one of the claims that's made by the Democrats is that uh, he's not independent enough. He's not willing to say no to the president. Well, I think that could be true, but I suspect that it's the other way around. Uh, president Bush is not a lawyer. I do not see him as a uh, uh, President Nixon type. He seems to be more aloof from the legal and policy details like President Reagan was, which makes him very dependent upon the legal experts that are around him. And I think the problem has been that um, Alberto Gonzalez and uh, Vice President Cheney have given the president terrible advice, not just in the national security area, but in other areas as well. Uh, we shouldn't forget that they talked Bush into signing the McCain-Feingold uh, bill into law. Uh, even while he was sim simultaneously signing it into law, they had him uh, put out an official signing statement where the president acknowledged that the bill was unconstitutional. So I think he's just been getting uh, terrible legal advice uh, across the board. And uh, my colleague here at uh, Cato, Gene Healy, and I lay out the details uh, in this report that we uh, released last year from Cato. It's called Power Surge, the Constitutional Record of, of George W. Bush. Now, since I'm the moderator, I thought I should get my perspective out on the table or, or at least out on the lectern uh, right away at the outset by, by way of uh, full disclosure. Uh, but enough from me. Let's turn now to our experts and see what they have to say. Uh, the format for our debate this afternoon is going to be very straightforward. Each speaker is going to have 20 minutes to make their initial presentation. Then we're going to have a very brief second round of five minutes where they will have an opportunity to respond to what the other person has said. Uh, we'll then take questions uh, from you all for about 10 to 15 minutes before we adjourn for lunch upstairs in the Cato Winter Garden. Uh, Bruce Fine will speak first, and then I will introduce Andrew McCarthy when it is his turn to speak. Uh, Bruce Fine is uh, well qualified uh, to debate today's topic. Uh, he has been a fixture on the Washington legal scene for more than 20 years. 
He served in a number of senior posts in the Justice Department during the Reagan administration. Uh, since then, in, in, in addition to his private practice, he's a, he's a very prolific writer. He's published dozens and dozens of articles in the scholarly journals, in the op-eds of the leading newspapers, and in the political uh, opinion magazines. He also has a regular column locally here in the Washington Times. Uh, Mr. Fine is frequently invited to testify uh, before Congress on constitutional and other legal issues. And a few months ago, he launched an important new project called the American Freedom Agenda. And the purpose of this project is to restore the Constitution's checks and balances with federal legislation, and also to bring constitutional grievances uh, to the attention, to bring them out into the political campaign so that journalists and voters can understand where the candidates stand on these various civil liberties issues. So would you please welcome our first speaker, Mr. Bruce Fine. Thank you for that lavish introduction. When any speaker hears the effusions, should be reminded of Sam Johnson's quip. When uttering lapidary praise, a man is not under oath. <laughs> I submit that we stand at present at a constitutional crossroads. The first question to be asked is why are we here? Why is this discussion so important? I think the answer is that post 9-11, the changes in the Constitution's distribution of powers that has been urged by the President are not temporary, as in all previous crises and warfares. We always had earlier understood that there would be an ending date to the war, whether it was the USS Missouri and Tokyo Bay, or whether it was Appomattox, or otherwise. But there is no defining endpoint to the so-called war against international terrorism. No one has even conceived of a standard by which a President would stand up and say, there's no risk. That anywhere in the world is there a terrorist who wants to kill an American in a terrorist attack. And thus, we have to consider the issues that I will discuss with Andy today as being issues that will be permanently on the American constitutional scene. Now, I take as the starting point of discussion the revolutionary ideas of the Founding Fathers. That is, that the primary and chief purpose of government is to make us free to develop our faculties and to pursue what Jefferson called happiness. Virtue and wisdom was the understanding of that term at the time of the founding. That's the major purpose of government as conceived in the United States Constitution. It's not to aggrandize government. It's not to build world empires. And with that being the standard, the founding fathers understood that freedom was the rule and government intervention to protect the security and safety was the exception. There had to be a standard of need or urgency required in order to surmount the barrier to encroaching on freedoms. It wasn't to be an insurmountable barrier. As Justice Robert Jackson wrote, the Constitution is not a suicide pact, but it had to be a serious barrier. And I submit today that the United States and the chief executive post 9-11 has flipped that customary burden of proof. And the basic discourse has been in justifying these presidential initiatives, unless we're a police state that smells like Nazi Germany, let us do it. Trust me. And freedom takes a secondary role, creating an inverse of the vision of the Founding Fathers. And let me give you examples where I think the standard has not even been close to being satisfied of encroaching and departing from our customary due process protections in this war against international terrorism. Take military commissions. They violate the customary rule that we have an independent judiciary and that one branch shouldn't play judge, jury, and prosecutor, as was done in Alice in Wonderland. I think that was the Red Queen, but maybe have it wrong. Because when you combine all of those three duties in one branch, the likelihood of error is very great. If you're prosecuting someone, you're probably going to decide that he's guilty if you're the one who's deciding on the, the facts and the law. That doesn't mean that there can never be a need of military commissions. You may have an urgency to have them on the battlefield where you need evidence that's fresh. And otherwise, there would be chaos without an instant verdict. But the military commissions that the president has established, first before the Hamden decision of the Supreme Court held, they were illegal when they were initiated without congressional authority. And then in the aftermath of the Military Commissions Act of 2006, now being erected with congressional authority. There has never been a showing that these grievous departures from due process are needed in order to get convictions of people involved in war crimes. 
for example, providing material assistance to a terrorist organization. And he tried these cases when he was the U.S. attorney. They're tried right at present. Jose Padilla is basically tried for the same events that David Hicks was tried for, for a military commission. But he's being tried in the civilian court, where there's opportunity for cross-examination. You have separation of the prosecution function and the jury function and the judging function. The military commissions have been used, say, once in six years. How urgent were they? Once in six years? And compared to the sentence that David Hicks received, nine months, the civilian counterpart of Mr. Hicks was American Taliban John Walker Lynn. He received 20 years imprisonment, and this was a federal civilian court. So I say this is an example, I think, of the president seeing that politically it was optically useful to say we're tough on terrorism, we're creating these military commissions, even though they're not utilized, and then trying to criticize or assail detractors of what was done as being weak on the war against terrorism. Let's move to an area, another area. And this is the idea that we need extraordinary renditions in order to prosecute the war successfully. Now, what are extraordinary renditions? This consists of the government of the United States saying that we have authority to kidnap anybody we see abroad that we suspect is al-Qaeda or a criminal, throw them into a secret prison, interrogate them in whatever way we wish, coercion, torture, or otherwise, dump them out in the... Uh, the hinterlands of Albania, all outside of the law. All outside of the law. Think of what that standard means for you and me. Suppose we're sitting outside the Louvre in Paris, and Vladimir Putin thinks that we said a few sympathetic notes about the Chechens. He sends his, maybe his old KGB, I think the new name is the Federal Security Services, but I could be wrong, Andy probably correct me. Kidnaps us, send us to Belarus to be in a dungeon there. He says, well, what's the standard of legality of this? President Bush. Where is the showing that we couldn't, in these circumstances, if we had someone, say, was the equivalent of Adolf Eichmann or Carlos the Jackal, if you need to kidnap people because they're in jurisdictions that don't comply with the rule of law, you take them back for a trial and offer them with due process. Adolf Eichmann was tried. Now, there is an arguable justification for all of this secrecy and unaccountability. Say, well, suppose, Mr. Fine, we alerted the enemy that we captured individual X by publicizing the capture when we had an open trial. Wouldn't they be alerted to take evasive action because we made some penetration into their security system? And that's a hypothetical that's possibly true. But if that standard is accepted as justifying a departure from our customary due process principles, we might as well hold every single trial. All arrests for any kind of terrorism link crime should all be in secret. We should never know about any of this stuff. Because if we kept it all secret and only the president knew that he had this secret underground prison, then al-Qaeda couldn't possibly take evasive action. That simply, in my judgment, is not an acceptable standard to justify violation of the openness that our First Amendment cherishes and due process requires in order to assure accurate verdicts and accountability. Let me move now to another area. This is what was mentioned briefly as the National Security Agency's warrantless surveillance program. You may recall that after experiencing 40 years of unchecked executive power to gather foreign intelligence, uh, the Church Committee that was established in 1975 and 76 concluded that these secret and unchecked authorities caused untold abuses. 30 years of secret and illegal mailing, mail openings, 30 years of illegal interceptions of international telegraphs, misusing the National Security Agency for non-intelligence purposes in order to obtain political intelligence, political intelligence against the enemies, making files for political reasons, not foreign intelligence reasons, required some modest congressional check or regulation of the authority to gather foreign intelligence. And the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978 was the result. It's a very mild act. It explicitly applies in times of war. It says during that period for 15 days, the customary obligation to get a warrant based upon probable cause to initiate a surveillance to gather foreign intelligence can be waived. And during that 15-day interval, the president, if he needs it to be extended, to go to Congress and ask that it be made longer. There are also provisions for emergency initiations of electronic surveillance in times where life could be threatened or you need the information immediately to 
frustrate a terrorist attack. It initially was 24 hours, now it's 72 hours. It may be extended in revisions of the act to 72 hours. That's one of the ideas. But the key to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that when the president was going to target an American on American soil to gather foreign intelligence under the belief that the U.S. citizen was acting as an agent of a foreign power or somehow in complicity with international terrorism, he had to go to a judge, an independent judge, and convince them that there was serious reason to believe some implication in terrorism was occurring. And that justified this encroachment on privacy. Now, why do we care about that? Why should we care that there should be restraints upon the president's ability to go search and seize any conversation he wants, enter your homes as he wants? After all, if the president can search everywhere, break and enter our homes, get all of our emails, all of our telecom telecommunications conversations, then aren't we safer? Because the more information I have, the greater likelihood sometimes, someplace, we'll stumble upon some information relevant to thwarting terrorism. And certainly there's something to that idea. If you have a police state, you can get more information. If you threw everybody in prison, none of them is going to commit a crime. And we'd stop, you know, there'd be no threat of terrorism in the United States if we were all in prisons. But the whole idea of a free society is that we make judgments about relative degrees of risks we take as a community in order to have freedom, not live in jails. That's why we had FISA and the Fourth Amendment. Now, the president, nonetheless, in the aftermath of 9-11, did not go to Congress and suggest that FISA was unworkable and needed amendment. He just said, I'm not going to comply with FISA, at least from what the public testimony suggests. That is, the public testimony corroborates the idea that interceptions were made that otherwise would be governed by FISA, but without any of its regulations and controls. We could ask, again, what was the need for flouting a federal law directly and flagrantly, which has continued to be flouted to this very day? Where was the evidence that the administration came up with and said, Mr. Fine or Mr. Member of Congress, if we comply with this warrant requirement, we will not get the intelligence we need to frustrate Al-Qaeda. Remember, they had a background that they could have worked with in presenting examples of how many years, 1978 to 2001. That's what, 23 years they could have said, well, at least in these cases, it won't work. We'll lose the opportunity to prevent another 9-11. Nowhere. And indeed, the 9-11 Commission report, which is oftentimes held up as the gold standard of saying what we needed to do prospectively, to forestall a second edition, nowhere says FISA was terrible, it didn't operate appropriately, you need to amend it in order to fight terrorism. It was just the president saying, well, it looks good, we're gathering more intelligence, and anybody who can criticize this will be weak on terrorism. And the president resorted to misrepresentations in order to sell this package to the American people. His signature hypothetical, you may recall, was as follows. Suppose al-Qaeda's calling into the United States. An American picks up the phone. Do you want us to stop listening? And most people would say no. And that's the correct answer. And you know what? That call, when you're targeting al-Qaeda as broad, is not covered by FISA. It covers situations where American citizens on American soil are the target. They're the ones that are suspected of implication in terrorism. When you're targeting someone abroad who's the suspect, FISA and the Fourth Amendment don't apply, according to very clear and explicit Supreme Court decisions. So again, we come back to a situation where we have resorted to this extraordinary method of gathering intelligence outside of any judicial control or regulation as stipulated by Congress without any showing of need or justification. Now you could imagine if there was a great success story in obtaining intelligence that frustrated a terrorist attack because of the violation of FISA, it would be leaked to the front pages of the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, instantly. Remember, Scooter Libby was pretty good at leaking information and Carl Rove to the newspapers when it came to discrediting Mr. Joseph Wilson with regard to the effort by the Iraqis to purchase uranium in Niger. So they don't know how to do this. But have we read this any place? No. No indication that this extraordinary measure, which I concede might be required in some circumstances, was needed. Let me go to the fourth situation, which I think, again, shows this pattern of extraordinary departures from our customary legal regime 
without any showing of need. This is the suspension of habeas corpus. What was this great writ all about? It emerged at the time of Magna Carta, where King John had the habit of throwing his political opponents in the dungeons on his say-so alone. Maybe it was the antecedent of the letters de cachette that Louis XVI resorted to to send people to the Bastille. He, however, ended up in a worse position than King John, who only had to negotiate the Magna Carta. King Louis ended up at the guillotine. The idea of habeas corpus is fundamental because it suggests when you have an executive detention, there ought to be an obligation for the individual detained to get an independent judicial assessment about whether the, defend, the detention is legal. Remember, habeas doesn't create a single right. It just says you ought to have a judge examine the legality of your detention. Nothing shocking about that. It's one of the few rights that was enshrined in the Constitution itself without any Bill of Rights needed to amend the initial document. And yet, the, at the behest of the administration, the Congress of the United States has suspended habeas corpus for detainees at Guantanamo Bay. Now, the Constitution acknowledges two situations where the suspension is proper, in times of invasion or insurrection or rebellion, neither of which obtains here. What is the great fear of permitting someone on Guantanamo Bay to file a writ of habeas corpus? And the judge say, Your Honor, I think I'm being held here illegally. I'm not an enemy combatant. I've not had involvement in active hostilities against the United States. All I want is a fair hearing. Now, if there were a track record that showed that habeas resulted in springing to freedom all these terrible criminals, maybe you'd be worried about the process. It wasn't accurate enough about identifying true terrorists or true criminals. But there was no compilation of such a record. Indeed, before the suspension, we had habeas corpus extended to Guantanamo Bay pursuant to a Supreme Court ruling called Rousel and Bush. And with the writ available, there wasn't any imminent danger of showing that, aha, Osama bin Laden himself will be freed because of the great burdens placed upon the government to show someone being detained is there illegally. Now, I would have less qualms about the detention program without habeas corpus if we're dealing with members of the Third Reich, people who are openly and notoriously captured by the United States on a battlefield and placed there. But we have a dealing with the situation in Guantanamo where 95% of the detainees were not captured by the United States and we hold them to a higher standard of reliability on the field. They were captured by the Northern Alliance, people who had a vested interest in accusing their tribal rivals or ethnic rivals of being Al-Qaeda. One, they got a reward. Two, they're able to take out those who are the subject of their vendettas and remove them from the scene. That doesn't mean that everyone at Guantanamo is innocent. It means that you have to have, however, a serious process for identifying those who are truly enemy combatants from those who are not. A former commandant of Guantanamo said most people don't belong there. A deputy said the same thing. That's why we have judicial process, is to ensure that we make a proper cut. After all, the difference between civilization and barbarism is civilization cares about only punishing those who are guilty. If you're barbaric, who cares? You just throw everybody who's your enemy into prison and punish them, it doesn't matter to you. But we in the United States care about that because it says what we are as a people. We want to make distinctions between guilt and innocence. I do not think that the questions that we've examined here are ultimately going to be decided in court. It's going to be the political consensus that you and members of Congress reach about where the balance is to be struck <clears throat> in post 9-11 years between being scrupulous about honoring our safeguards against government abuses and casting them aside on the theory that, ah, oh, even the smallest risk of error justifies throwing all of the customary separation of powers and checks aside on the fear that somewhere, sometime, someplace, there's a tiny risk someone may evade our grasp. That is the price of some kind of democracy and openness in government that we must pay. I go back to the theorem that, yes, it is possible to reduce the risk of terrorism by creating a police state and eliminating all of our free speech and due process protections. But the price is the end of our republic. That's too high a price to pay. Thank you.
Thanks, Bruce. Uh, our second speaker, Andrew McCarthy, is also well qualified uh, to address today's topic. Uh, for 18 years, he served as a federal prosecutor in New York City, and his most important case involved the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center. He prosecuted Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman and 11, under, 11 other individuals for the 1993 attack and for another plot to bomb landmarks in New York City. For his excellent work on that case, he earned the Justice Department's highest honor, the Attorney General's Exceptional Service Award. He is also widely published uh, in, the, uh, in the literature, the magazines, and our leading newspapers. His regular column can be found at National Review Online. He presently is director of the Center for Law and Counterterrorism at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Would you please welcome our second speaker, Andrew McCarthy. <laughs> <clears throat> thank you, Tim, for the kind introduction, and, and thank you also for the invitation to, to be here, uh, particularly with uh, uh, someone as esteemed as Bruce to talk about these issues. And I want to start, I think, where Bruce started, because I think it's a valuable question. Why are we here? And I, I think what we've glossed over is the reason why we're here is what happened before 9-11, and that's a, a history that doesn't take all that long to retrace. Um, but between the eight years uh, from the time when the World Trade Center was first bombed until it was ultimately destroyed, um, we now know a few things on the basis of not only the results of the prosecutions that took place in that era, but uh, as a result of the investigations that have been done uh, into uh, what's been called intelligence failure. Uh, since 9-11. Uh, two things we know. One, we know that during that eight-year period, uh, the United States was struck again and again on an average of about once a year in attacks that became more audacious over time. Uh, the Trade Center bombing later applied on New York City landmarks, uh, which was happily thwarted because we were lucky enough to have a, uh, a human intelligence, a, an informant inside. Uh, plot to take out U.S. airliners uh, over the Pacific, uh, the Cobar Towers bombing, the 1998 destruction of our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, uh, the 2000 attack on the USS Cole, uh, and finally 9-11. We know not only that the country was being attacked again and again uh, by a wartime belligerent. Uh, we may not have been at war, but they certainly were, and they told us that again and again. Uh, but we also know that the ranks of the enemy were growing larger. There's a lot of dispute among quote-unquote experts about how uh, robust a movement al-Qaeda actually is and whether we should count members or uh, affiliates and the like. But the one thing there is consensus on is that the enemy was getting larger and larger and more emboldened uh, in that eight-year period. Um, during that time, the criminal justice system in the United States was not only the point of the counter-terrorist sphere, it was the entire sphere. Um, the counter-terrorist strategy of the United States was prosecution in the criminal justice system uh, with all of the attendant protections and uh, due process protections that, uh, that Bruce spoke about. And what we now know about that experiment is the following. Uh, in what I believe were about nine trials. Most of them were in uh, the office I was privileged to work in, the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York. Um, about six major and, and three uh, somewhat less substantial prosecutions. Um, all that took place in that eight-year period, um, at a time when the enemy was growing uh, both larger and more audacious, we managed to take out exactly 29 terrorists. 29. Uh, and for the most part, uh, that 29, with, with maybe a handful of exceptions, were about the lowest ranking uh, players that uh, existed in the jihadist network uh, that carried out all of these attacks. Now, we can take away from that the fact that the, the system worked in the sense that with respect to all of the people who were charged, they were all successfully prosecuted and, and ultimately convicted and sentenced. Uh, so as, as a matter of due process, uh, perhaps that holds up as a shining example. But as a national security uh, strategy, uh, it's a disaster. 
Uh, it was basically an invitation to be hit again and again, and uh, as a result, of course, we were hit again and again. Um, and here I have to take issue with a second major premise uh, of Bruce's, which is that, um, you know, he says the, the main purpose of the federal government uh, is to allow us to be free. Um, I actually think that glosses over the, the key element. The main purpose of the federal government, the main job of the, pres the federal government, certainly the President of the United States, is to make us safe so that we can enjoy our freedom. That's the highest responsibility of government, the security of the governed. Uh, it's up to us to actuate our freedom, but the government's job is to make it possible, and making it possible means making it safe. Uh, and that, I think, is what this debate in the main is about. I actually uh, am a little bit surprised because the thing I, I turn out to, I think, disagree with Bruce the most about is not what I anticipated um, disagreeing with him the most about. Um, I, I think that we could probably arrive at some agreement about, uh, you know, separation of powers and the fact that the, the president does have this, uh, this separate reservoir of power. I want to talk about that a little bit, but I, I thought that would be our main dispute, and I, I really don't think it turns out to be. What does turn out to be our main dispute is I think he is conflating something that is very, very importantly different. And that is that there is and there has always been a major difference in the way that our law regards the American body politic and the area of the world that is external to the American body politic. Bruce talked about due process. He mentioned it a number of times. And, you know, look, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I love being a lawyer, and I, I very much am, am proud of the fact of, uh, of having been able to participate in those cases uh, in the 90s. Um, but due process is the process that is due. I mean, that sounds trite, but um, that is what due process is. And what is due process within our body politic has never, ever been regarded as being the same as what we owe to the rest of the world. Um, you know, Bruce, I guess, started out talking about military commissions as if they were a great aberration. What's an aberration is actually having unlawful enemy combatants in wartime have access to the courts of the United States. The United States has taken in its history over two million prisoners of war. There has never, until this war, uh, and until, in fact, very recently in this war, been systematic access to the courts of the United States uh, for people who have been captured in wartime. Now, Bruce says, and I think this is absolutely correct, that this war uh, is a different kind of war, and the enemy that we face is a different kind of enemy. Um, there is a vast difference, and, and the nature of the beast here is that there always will be a question because you're not dealing with people who are uh, in uniform carrying their weapons openly. You're always going to have a question about whether the people that you're dealing with are actual enemy combatants uh, or whether they're not. But there's an undertone to that, too, and that is what al-Qaeda does uh, and what militant Islam as a general matter does is flout the laws of war. It actually undermines the humanity uh, and the humanizing impulses, the civilizing impulses that are behind the Geneva Conventions and, uh, and most of the assumptions that we have in our laws. Uh, and the fact is that we have a dilemma. Yes, it's true when we arrest somebody or we apprehend somebody in this type of a war in wartime, there is an issue about whether the person is a, a enemy combatant or not. Uh, but the other thing that we can't allow ourselves to forget uh, is that if you take these particular enemy combatants, and, and most of them are enemy combatants, um, and you give them all of the rights that criminal defendants have in the United States, something that has never been done for honorable combatants in the history of the United States, what you are doing necessarily is rewarding the barbarity that is behind al-Qaeda's methods. And rewarding that kind of behavior is a guarantee of getting more of that kind of behavior. Um, military commissions 
in fact, are not an aberration. They're a norm. General Washington used them in the, uh, in the Revolutionary War. They've been used throughout wars in the history of the United States. They're not a grievous departure from due process uh, because they have been the process that is due um, to enemy combatants who violate the laws of war, and they have been from the beginning of, uh, of our country. Um, suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. The writ of habeas corpus is not suspended as to a person unless that person has the right to it in the first place. Uh, it has always been the law of the United States a, that there is a difference between the application of the protections of the Constitution inside the United States to our body politic, to U.S. persons, you know, not only citizens, but people who have a connection with our country in an, in an immigration sense that is sufficient and significant enough to have brought them into uh, the fabric of our society. Those people get the full run of habeas corpus, and they always have. But enemy combatants have never systematically been able to have access to our courts. Uh, alien enemy combatants are extra constitutional creatures. And, you know, Bruce mentioned the Razul case uh, and said that, you know, the reason that they had. Uh, habeas corpus rights is because of a 2004 Supreme Court decision in Razul. Well, that's true enough, but the, the avenue that the court cited in giving the enemy combatants access to the courts was not the Constitution of the United States, because they don't have rights under the Constitution of the United States. What Razul is about is the habeas corpus statute. The reason we have a Detainee Treatment Act, the reason we have a Military Commissions Act, the reason we've been able to change the law with respect to, uh, you know, going from what the Supreme Court said the enemy combatants were entitled to to what they're now entitled to, the reason the court was able to make that change is because whatever rights the prisoners had were the function of a statute, not our fundamental law. And when that happens, Congress always has a right to change the statute, and that's exactly what Congress did. Another major uh, misimpression that's come out of all this is it's not only that the habeas rights haven't been suspended, um, there's really a, a, a gross misunderstanding in the country about what the enemy combatants are actually entitled to under uh, the Military Commissions Act. Bruce mentioned, you know, wh what is habeas corpus? It is the great fundamental right for somebody who is apprehended and held by the authorities to command them to come into court and make a showing of cause of why they are apprehended, uh, why they're being detained. That, where they may not call it habeas corpus, but that precisely is what the alien enemy combatants get under the Detainee Treatment Act and under uh, the way it's been uh, refined in the Military Commissions Act. Yes, the military proceedings will have to go forward. Uh, each detainee is entitled to a combatant status review tribunal uh, to make whatever claims he can make against his uh, capture. I don't want to pretend that that's uh, the, the type of model of due process that, that Bruce talked about before. Uh, it's a difficult proceeding for a combatant to win, although some have won. Um, but it should be a difficult proceeding because warfare uh, is in essence, an executive branch function. Um, and you, there's nothing that says that a court, rather than the executive branch, uh, is a better source of authority for us to rely on in terms of who should be held and who should not be held in wartime. But each combatant does get a CSRT, a Combatant Status Review Tribunal, to, to challenge his detention. Uh, each combatant who is charged and tried in a military commission um, also will end up having a right to appeal um, not only through the military system, but ultimately to the United States courts. So the, the detentions get appealed, and the military commissions get appealed. Now, you know, one big complaint about that is, well, they have to go through the whole military system before they'll ever get to the uh, United States Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, which is where these cases will ultimately end up. But, you know, if they were state prisoners in the United States, they would have to go through the entire process of, of the state. They'd have to exhaust all of their state remedies before they'd get the federal door open to them. And I would respectfully suggest 
that there's no reason that we should be giving alien enemy combatants in wartime uh, a shorter route to the federal courthouse uh, than we give our own citizens who are uh, prisoners of uh, the 50 states. Um, what happens when they get finally to uh, the D.C. Circuit? Um, again, there's a lot of, there seems to be a lot of confusion about this. I see the New York Times repeatedly has said that the only thing that they'll get to do, uh, and this is in the reporting in the New York Times, uh, that the only thing that the prisoners will get to do when they ultimately get to uh, the D.C. Circuit will be to challenge whether the proceeding that they went through, whether it's a review tribunal or a military commission, whether it was consistent with the rules that the military has set up for those proceedings. And that is just not so. Um, the law specifically says that the prisoners will also be able to raise the question whether those proceedings were a violation of the Constitution and the laws of the United States. Now, that doesn't mean that they'll win. The fact that we give them the opportunity to make that challenge doesn't mean that they actually have rights under the laws and the Constitution of the United States. But the court will at least have a chance and an opportunity to hear that claim articulated and to make a reasoned decision about it. And I would suggest, on the basis of how the Supreme Court has treated the combatant cases and how the, the other lower federal courts who have dealt with them have treated those cases, that we can expect that the courts will look very closely and very carefully uh, at, at what the combatants claim. Uh, and if they make a decent case that their rights have been violated, um, that'll be grounds for, if, if not condemnation, at least uh, reversal. Um, so I, I do think that it, it's very, uh, the, the complaint about the process that is being given to the alien combatants, the enemy combatants in Guantanamo Bay, uh, is greatly overstated. Um, Bruce mentioned renditions. I really don't want to argue much about renditions because I'm not a big fan of renditions either. Um, I, I actually think they're bad policy. Um, we are members of a, uh, a treaty that uh, obliges us. It's the uh, United Nations Convention Against Torture and Cruel and Human and Degrading Treatment. We are obliged under that treaty uh, not to transport people into the hands of authorities who uh, we have reason to suspect might subject them to torture or cruel and human and degrading treatment. Um, you can argue, I think, that that's a, that was a foolish agreement for us to make because what it, what it essentially means is if, for example, we pick somebody up who is, uh, say, an Egyptian, um, we can't return him to his native land. So we are, we're <clears throat> then stuck with the dilemma of, well, what do you do with such a person if you don't want to prosecute him under your own laws? And, um, you know, you, you, you have a situation where the State Department puts out a, a list every year of torture countries and, and Egypt is on it. Uh, I think there might have been at least a carve out for um, the nationals of a, of a state, but that, that didn't happen. And I think the reason that we're very hesitant to, to sign treaties, as we should be, uh, is that when, when we sign them, they're serious business and, and we should take our obligations solemnly. And I don't think, uh, it, it, at least for me, it doesn't pass muster uh, to be told that, you know, we get a guarantee with respect to each of these, uh, each of these po folks who is picked up uh, that whatever country we're giving them to won't torture them. Um, I think that, you know, if our country is putting out a list every year of torture countries, then we shouldn't be rendering people to those countries. Um, the, uh, the NSA, um, I actually thought would be the, the major part of our discussion today. And let me, let me just say a couple of things about it. First of all, I don't know if the 9-11 Commission is the gold standard or not of, uh, you know, of what the record is of, of our counterterrorism failures. Um, but I will say this, the 9-11 Commission had a very, very good reason not to go too deeply into FISA. Uh, and that is because uh, a member of the com Commission uh, was actually involved in what the major FISA controversy was prior to 9-11, which was the so-called wall uh, between the intelligence side of the House and the criminal justice side of the House. And I must say, with due respect to people who are on the commission, including Commissioner Gorelick, who I have great respect for, um, 
they should have written, as far as I'm concerned, a 600-page report about the wall um, if they really wanted to talk about structural intelligence failure. Uh, instead, what the 9-11 Commission report is, is about, you know, 600 pages on something, uh, on a variety of other things, and really about a page or a page and a half of the wall, which mentions it fleetingly and then immediately dismisses it as a problem. And I, I think that's an enormous problem for the 9-11 Commission, given the uh, obvious conflict of interest that, uh, that Commissioner Gorelick had. Um, but just moving on to the to the NSA scandal for a minute, I just uh, and scandal I, is a word I use uh, probably shouldn't use, but um, I, I just want to stress a couple of things. Um, number one, the this idea of um, executive authority to overrule uh, overrule statutes or not to uh, not to enforce statutes did not get invented with George Bush. Um, when FISA itself was enacted, Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter's Attorney General Griffin Bell testified that the President maintained authority uh, to do warrantless surveillance, notwithstanding the statute. When the statute was amended in 1994, Deputy Attorney General Jamie Gorilla, the amendment at the time, uh, by the way, was to allow, the, uh, allow FISA not only to cover interceptions of conversations, but physical searches. Attorney General Gorelick testified that the administration, the president, maintained the authority uh, to order warrantless searches in national security cases. The Office of Legal Counsel, uh, headed by Walter Dellinger during the Clinton administration, has elaborate memoranda in it about the duty of the president uh, not to enforce statutes that he believes are unconstitutional. Uh, the Congress enacted a uh, war powers resolution in 1973. Every U.S. president since it's been enacted uh, has refused to enforce it because it's a unconstitutional infringement on his powers. Um, has Bush pushed the envelope more than others? I, I guess that's the legacy. Um, but I think this idea that he invented this issue or this controversy uh, is one that just doesn't hold up on the historical record. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have a brief second round. Bruce, five, five minutes. Either, either way. I think that Andy's forceful presentation corroborates my observation. He went into legal arguments and technical distinctions between aliens and U.S. citizens, which I'll elaborate on later, that didn't go to the merits of whether these departures from customary due process and freedom were warranted. Notice that he didn't try to cite a single instance where if you applied regular habeas corpus, you applied FISA, that suddenly it would handicap the executive in an improper way in fighting against terrorism. It was just, well, the, the attorney general had reserved the right to claim the statute was unconstitutional in 1978, and maybe it was overreaching. But he didn't go in and saying, and this is how the statute applies, and it just didn't work, Bruce. That is what is most worrisome to me, and I think it's the greatest danger to our civil liberties in post-9-11 world. This argument, well, we don't have to think about whether the customary processes work. It's just we can assume 9-11 created a new, brave new world, and freedoms now are automatically depreciated because we have this horror of seeing all those buildings burning by that savage attack on 9-11. With regard to some of the particulars, First of all, the distinctions that he has suggested are invariably there between citizen and non-citizen is not accurate. The president has claimed and asserted the authority to identify persons as enemy, illegal enemy combatants if they're U.S. citizens. That is the first, the famous Hamdi case, or Jose Padilla. They're U.S. citizens who customarily should enjoy all of the rights of U.S. citizens, including a right to habeas corpus. Moreover, let's think about that distinction when it comes to the National Security Agency's warrantless surveillance program. As I explained, it doesn't apply when you're targeting an alien abroad. Its application and what the administration is seeking to evade is an obligation to get a warrant when it's a U.S. citizen standing on American soil and he's or she is the suspect of the wrongdoing. That has direct application right in the United States. Let's then go to the issue of Guantanamo Bay, where the detainees are being held. Uh, 
Now, if you ask Fidel Castro who has sovereignty over Guantanamo Bay, I think he'd tell you the United States does. For all intents and purposes, it should be viewed as the equivalent of United States sovereign territory. Why? Because we make all the decisions there. We have a perpetual lease there. Nobody goes there without our permission. We run the law there. It seems to me highly artificial and technical to suggest that somehow Guantanamo Bay should be viewed as though it was in Germany or in Europe. That's simply a distortion of the facts on the ground. I want to go back to a situation where I think we can draw direct parallels to what the administration is conceding is workable in the domestic sphere and then suddenly changes the rules of the game in some other sphere for, I think, political optics. Two instances, the National Security Agency's warrantless surveillance program. What the Attorney General has testified to is if you have al-Qaeda smuggled into the United States, you have Osama bin Laden talking to uh, a, a colleague in the United States, we don't do the warrantless surveillance program. If it's a domestic to domestic call, no matter who's doing the calling, we go through FISA. Now you could think in terms of time sensitivity, if it's a domestic to domestic call, that's where you would think the urgency of flouting FISA and gutting even with a standard of not even reasonable suspicion to capture that it call is greatest. And yet the administration says we don't use the National Security Agency's warrantless program there. We go through FISA. That's sufficient. Well, it seems then quite odd to suggest that somehow FISA can't work if the call isn't domestic to domestic, it's to domestic to international. Now let's go to the military commission's jurisdiction. The same offense that was tried before the military commission, allegedly on the basis of what Andy is saying, this great need that during wartime due process is different because the danger is so much greater. The same offense, giving material assistance to a terrorist organization, training in a terrorist training camp, was charged against David Hicks before the military commission. That's being tried right now in a federal civilian court against Jose Padilla. Well, why is one in the civilian court, and that's good enough, and the other one's in the military commission? There ought to be an explanation for that discrepant treatment. And then the last point I want to make, and this relates to the general theories that are propounded by this administration, which are quite alarming. And that's the theory of a worldwide military battlefield. And I've had debates with the proponents, including John Yu, and the argument is this. Since Osama and Al-Qaeda want to kill us everywhere, all of the world is a battlefield where military weapons and military tactics are appropriate. Thus, in the United States, when Jose Padilla landed at O'Hare Airport, and we suspect that he was Al-Qaeda, we could have shot a rocket at him and destroyed the entire airport because this is wartime. Everywhere in the United States is wartime. We are sitting in a combat zone right now because Al-Qaeda wants to kill us, and therefore the military can come in and shoot any of us that they think is Al-Qaeda. That clearly has application directly in the United States, and I think it suggests that the debate we're having is far more than whether we maybe in an act of, uh, that goes beyond historical tradition, applies due process or customary guarantees against government abuses uh, in this post-9-11 atmosphere. Thanks. Okay, Andrew, five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, are, they, are these um, procedures warranted that we're now using? I, I actually thought I did cover that at the, at the beginning. I thought it was obvious enough, for, but uh, let me spell it out a little better. Um, we tried it the other way for a number of years, and it didn't work. Um, now, that doesn't mean that I, I think the president gets a blank check. The president doesn't get a blank check. Um, but we did try to fight the war on terror as a criminal justice matter, and it led to disastrous consequences. Uh, if you want to get down to chapter and verse, Osama bin Laden, the head of al-Qaeda, has been under indictment in this country. Um, since June of 1998. That's before the embassy bombings, before the coal, and before 9-11. Uh, continuing to add counts to the indictment each time something went boom and people died did not appear to deter him in any meaningful way. Um, one small incident. Uh, in the Blind Shea case, uh, complying with a, a, the law of the Second Circuit, uh, I was directed to supply the defense in the trial with a list of all unindicted co-conspirators in the case, which is designed to help defense counsel prepare for trial. Um, that list was handed over with all the appropriate uh, bells and whistles about don't disclose, can't disseminate, only useful for uh, trial preparation. Uh, and it was nonetheless handed right from 
uh, a, one of the defendants in our case to an al-Qaeda operative named Ali Mohammed, and ultimately delivered to bin Laden himself in the Sudan, uh, where al-Qaeda went to school on it, which you would expect it to do. Um, Co-conspirator list is a very valuable piece of information to have. It tells you everybody who is on the government's radar screen but hasn't yet been charged with something. Uh, it alerts you to the places where you may be compromised in terms of uh, informants and, and wiretaps. Um, that is the kind of thing that can't be policed if you're going to handle these cases as criminal justice matters. You will, in effect, be handing over intelligence to the enemy even as you fight the enemy in war. Uh, the last point I want to make, uh, and, uh, and I actually think that um, Bruce and I are, are more or less in agreement about this, even though we, we somewhat come out in a different place, but this essentially is a, is a political issue, not a not a legal issue. Um, national security is probably the quintessential political issue for a country. Um, there's been a lot of quoting Justice Jackson, uh, but one of the opinions that he actually wrote as a majority opinion for the court is rarely quoted, and that's the one he wrote in the Chicago Southern case in 1948, um, where he basically said that, uh, speaking for the court, that National security, foreign affairs, the collection of intelligence are paradigm political issues for the political branches and in particular for the president. They're issues that the courts do not have either the means to deal with or, the, frankly, the competence to deal with. Um, I think that was true then and I think it, uh, it continues to be true. Uh, and we see the results of it and I think the results of it are something we ought to be able to take comfort in. Uh, you know, Bruce mentioned enemy combatants and the fact that you could have an American citizen, which the Supreme Court now says uh, apparently is okay. You can have an American citizen uh, picked up as an enemy combatant and held. Um, but what have we seen with that? Um, I think there's been a grand total of two American citizens who've been taken as enemy combatants, and uh, both of those cases have been uh, disposed in their own way. One guy went back to Saudi Arabia, and, and Padilla is now being prosecuted in the criminal justice system. The NSA program, there was a big argument between the legal scholars about whether uh, FISA is a law or whether the president has uh, authority under Article II of the Constitution to, uh, to intercept these conversations. But one thing that didn't happen is the program didn't get ended. Why? Because the program was popular with the public. Uh, once the public learned about it and once they got the news accounts of what, was, what we were doing, um, the, the polls obviously showed that it was favored to the point that Congress could have stopped the program and could still stop it tomorrow by de denying funding. It didn't dare do that because the politics of it were such that the public wouldn't have stood for that. Um, and, I, and I think Guantanamo Bay is another moving target, but that will ultimately be decided by politics. If people's, if our perception of what we're doing down there uh, does not comport with what we want to be as America, then Guantanamo Bay either has to change or it's going to be ended. Uh, and that will be something that's done as a political calculus by the, by the political branches. And I think we ought to trust the American people uh, to put pressure on the political branches to come out to, to right results uh, and not kick every question over to the courts for decision. I think we've done a pretty good job as a citizenry uh, impacting what the political branches do in this thicket. Okay, we're going to open it up to questions now. Uh, I'm going to exercise the moderator's prerogative and answer or ask the first question. I want to pick up back on to the Jose Padilla case. Uh, Andrew, you said that uh, Bruce was conflating two aspects of the law, the law of the body politic and the law that applies to the rest of the world. But uh, Bruce also made the point that lawyers uh, for President Bush and the Department of Justice have gone into court and they have said that they consider the entire world, including every inch of U.S. territory, to be a battlefield. And the president reserves the right to arrest anybody in this room, anybody in America. He can put them on a plane tomorrow and fly them to Guantanamo, where they can be held in solitary confinement, kept from their attorneys, and subjected to what the president calls enhanced interrogation techniques. So he doesn't seem to respect this distinction that you're, you're drawing between uh, the body politic and the rest of the world. So can you elaborate a little bit on that point? Sure. I, I think when you decide whether he respects the distinction, 
you have to look at what he does in addition to what he says. When, when the executive branch goes into court, um, it doesn't just argue a case, it argues a prerogative. Uh, and it has to be willing to defend the prerogative on the worst case scenario. It doesn't mean that we're trying to accomplish the worst case scenario. Um, the Justice Department may go into court and say, yes, in theory we have this right, but as a practical matter, they've exercised it two times uh, in six years uh, under circumstances where we're at war and where we're taking plenty of prisoners who are not American citizens. By and large, predominantly, overwhelmingly, uh, American citizens have been treated with the full panoply of constitutional protections they have, and they've been continued to be treated in the criminal justice system. But I will tell you, if there's another terrorist attack in this country, or if there's multiple terrorist attacks in this country, the public will demand that the president apprehend people and hold them. Uh, so I think these are, you know, this again is a, a situation where politics ought to uh, be given a chance to work. The president hasn't gone, hasn't matched his uh, courtroom rhetoric with deeds because politically that would be suicidal. Uh, I'd respond by quoting uh, Justice Jackson in a different context where he said these kinds of precedents, even staking them out, are dangerous because they lie around like loaded weapons ready to be used at any future time of crisis. And what Andrew is saying is correct, that this ought to be decided in the political realm ultimately. But that's you and me and Andy. We can't say, well, we just don't know whether he ought to have this authority. We just say he doesn't, that that's dangerous and alarming, and we shouldn't just trust him to desist. What about his successors? What will they do with this claim that all of the world is a battlefield? And moreover, I think um, we should return to our own history you may recall that after the protest against the stamp tax in 1765, Britain ultimately, the parliament repealed the tax. They didn't want to have the protest. But then they issued a declaratory act saying, but we reserve the right of taxation without representation. And that caused then the Americans, the colonists, to remain alarmed. True, the tax was repealed, but they still claimed that authority. And to say, yeah, the president is only detained, I think it's three, Andy, rather than two, three U.S. citizens as enemy combatants, we ought to be relieved. But why? As long as he holds that sword of Damocles over every citizen's head, it necessarily casts a pallor on how vigorous we are in participating in self-government, criticizing the government. We think, well, especially since human nature is inclined to be reticent, if we say something, oh, I don't want to take the risk I'll be in Guantanamo Bay the next time. And very few of us out in the public, our lawyers and read the Supreme Court cases, are, you know, are, are uh, secure in the idea that, well, the president wouldn't push the envelope this far. And then you have to ask as well, well why is the president making this claim, outlandish claim in my judgment, that all of the world is a battlefield, on the theory that if there's ever a terrorist anywhere in the world who threatens any of us, we're always at warfare, a permanent power. And that seems to me ought to be repudiated by us. And I would hope Andrew would be one in the political realm to say, Mr. President, you ought to withdraw that claim. Could I, could I respond to that? Uh, why don't you come back to it? Sure. Okay. We'll have another, another opportunity. All right. Let's open this up a little bit. Uh, I have three requests. When I call on you, please wait for our microphone to arrive so that everybody can hear your question. Then please identify yourself and any affiliation that you may have. And please keep your questions brief so that we can get to as many people as possible. Right here. My name is Helen Anderson. Uh, I find this uh, subject so depressing. Uh, I have been under military surveillance most of my life. Uh, I just don't know what to do about it. I cannot get legal assistance. Uh, it is uh, just an awful case. Uh, and I wanted to mention that... Uh, uh, back in the 70s, the ACLU uh, <clears throat> had a slogan, uh, if you do not watch your civil liberties, uh, they will go away. Uh, my question is, uh, do you think that they have gone away? Okay. Anybody want to comment on that? I wasn't able to hear all of what she said. The ACLU said, if you're a what? If, if you don't watch your liberties, they'll, they'll erode. Well, that's if you read on many of the... Uh, monuments and buildings in the capital. 
vigilance is the eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Of course, we've got to fight and keep them. Remember what Ben Franklin said in emerging from the Constitutional Convention when a, an elderly lady asked him whether we got a republic or a monarchy. He says, a republic, if you can keep it. Democracy is not self-executing. If we don't fight for these day to day, whether in court or out of court, they will evaporate. Rights in the United States that have been enshrined in the Constitution have not been honored for a century because people didn't stand up and fight for them. And just think about those long years of Jim Crow. You had the equal protection of the law, you had 15th Amendment. They meant nothing because people didn't stand up and fight. Okay, down here. Raise your hand higher so that he can see you. Yeah. Hi. Um, I understand that there is a political check against... Please identify yourself. Oh. Um, I'm Harrison Suarez, and I am from the ACLU, uh, National Capital Area Branch. Um, so I understand that there is a political check against uh, the president's authority to extradite citizens to Guantanamo Bay. Um, but it seems to me that there's also a constitutional check in the Fourth Amendment, and that uh, the Milgin case, um, which asserted that you uh, have to try citizens in the civil courts when they're open, are... Um, are constitutional and legal checks against this power. Can you elaborate on where that um, mentality uh, originated and where the precedent originated for the Hamdi and Padilla cases? You know, I think there, um, it, it, it's obviously changed over time. And, I, I, you know, one critique of the, of the Hamdi case I actually agreed with was that if you were a purist, um, Scalia and and uh, and Justice Stevens, I thought, actually had the the better of the academic argument um, with respect to the American citizen. And I think, in terms of procedural regularity and even substantive regularity, um, it would be better if Congress, when it um, did an authorization for the use of military force, also defined a suspension of the writ of habeas corpus so that we had, you know, a, a settled definition of people, if you could come up with that, um, who actually could be apprehended. Um, but, you know, look, whether I, whether I think, what I, what I think the law ought to be is, is sort of irrelevant. The court has now said in Hamdi that this is a, this is a power that, uh, that the president has. Um, I, again, I, I think that um, and I'd say this generally in, in response to the, to the last question as well. It's true that we have to be concerned about these issues, and it's true that we ought to uh, fight for our liberty, and it's something that, uh, that, that can evaporate if we don't fight for it. But I also think people ought to take a step back and say the trajectory of civil liberties is very progressive in this country. If you go back and think about what we're fighting about now, and you go back to the Alien and Sedition Acts, you go back to habeas corpus during the, the Civil War, the Espionage Act prosecutions in the, in the 20th century, particularly in World War I and World War II, the Japanese internment. The things that we're arguing about now are not unimportant things, but those abuses or transgressions of civil liberties are no longer something I think that is even politically possible. And I think that's something that people ought to be able to take comfort in. Yes, we're fighting over very serious things, but the trajectory of what we're fighting over and the bounds of it is something I think that civil libertarians in particular should take some comfort in. I would just make this observation. It's different this time because previously, Alien Sedition Act, the, you know, the wars were going to end. We know this war will never end in the sense that political discourse treats a war against terrorism. So these are not temporary. The second thing is we just don't know the extent of the abuses, certainly with regard to the treatment of detainees in Eastern Europe and secret prisons. Take the one case that at least has some surface, Maher Arar. He was the Syrian Canadian who was dispatched to Syria where he was tortured. He came back. The, Syri the Canadians have exonerated him, paid him hundreds of thousands of dollars in damages. You say a little bit more. Where was he... Apprehended? Where did well, he was he was taken by the United States, apparently at the behest of the Canadians, when he was, I believe, Andy, you can correct me, I think it was at Kennedy Airport, and deported to Syria. That, that's the Eastern District of New York, so my people had nothing to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and Syria, and he, he alleged that he was tortured in Syria, ultimately held several years, and then returned to Canada, where the Canadians ultimately exonerated him of any implication in terrorism. He has brought suit in the United States, claiming damages for constitutional violations, which have been dismissed based upon the state secrets privilege. But this man's life has been uh, traumatized, if not terrorized, through a misapplication of due process. Uh, we don't know how many other incidents are out there. It may be that we're starting certainly at a higher plane of civil liberties because of statutes like FISA, which the president claims is unconstitutional, um, uh, and other Supreme Court rulings. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we must, if we want to protect our freedoms, continue to fight and denounce any encroachment. James Madison, we ought to be alarmed at the first encroachment on any of our civil liberties, not waiting till we're at the precipice. Okay, on the aisle there. Stanley Cobra with the Cato Institute. Um, this idea that the, the president has this power, but he hasn't abused it, to my mind, directly challenges the sentiment of the Declaration of Independence that we all have inalienable rights. George Washington elaborated on this in his famous letter to the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island. He said it is no longer by the indulgence of the government that you enjoy your fundamental liberties. He was talking about religious liberty, but that would apply to these liberties as well. To say that the president has this power but has not abused it is to say, in effect, that these rights are not inalienable, that we have them by the indulgence of the president, and we should be grateful that we have such a gracious president. No? I, I you know, I, I really don't, I, I really don't think so. I, I think that if you were the official who had to decide what position the United States was going to take in court about what the reservoir, what the, what the parameters of the President's Article II uh, authority are here, you'd, be, you'd have to take the following things into account. Number one, is all the world a battlefield? Well, the enemy has struck in, you know, four or five different continents and, in, and now has struck inside the mainland of the United States and has repeatedly warned uh, that it intends to do so again. It, I mean, it's trying night and day to do that. We have no idea where we might be hit next. I hope we don't get hit, but we could get hit any place, uh, number one. Number two, let's say we did get hit. Um, or let's say, you know, there was a, there, there was an invasion, whether it's, you know, this particular enemy or a more capable enemy. Um, if an American town got, uh, you know, got, got captured by enemy forces and we had to, to fight to free it up, um, you know, we don't have preventive detention in this country. Um, but can it be that under circumstances where, you know, part of our territory was at risk uh, and nobody could deny that part of our territory was at risk, uh, that the president as commander in chief conducting military operations couldn't apprehend people uh, in order who were, who were reasonably suspected to be in allegiance with the enemy, that he couldn't do uh, wiretapping absent permission from a court under those circumstances. I think that's preposterous. Now, I don't, I hope to God that those types of circumstances never happen, but it would be foolish to say that they couldn't happen and that if you're defining what your ultimate rights are uh, or what your ultimate powers are, that you can't take them into account. I believe the President of the United States has all of the power of the United States to repel any threat that is an actual threat to the United States, particularly from an outside enemy. Um, I think any president who tried to take advantage of that um, in, in, in peacetime and in what was obviously peacetime uh, and abused that license would be impeached or, uh, you know, basically kicked out of office by the electorate. Um, but I don't, I don't think that the fact that you have people, the possibility that a president could conduct himself as a rogue means that you ignore the fact that the power is there if the exigency ever made it necessary. Um, Andy's a great trial lawyer. I argue appellate cases, and that's not how you would argue the case if you wanted to prevail. The president, if you're arguing and you're not trying to, like Dick Cheney, create uh, one branch government, 
you would say, Your Honor, we don't need to address these other circumstances that Andy has elaborated that might require some extraordinary measures. This case doesn't go that far, and we urge you not to consider that. Because what happens to judges when you make these extravagant claims, they get alarmed about it. In fact, it defeats, it defeats the likelihood of success. That's why I think the government, Andy, lost Hamdi. Because they took the position is there's no judicial review whatsoever. The president says on his say-so, you're an enemy combatant, that's the end of the case. This is Louis XVI's letters de cachet saying you're in the Bastille, and that's the end. No court ever can ever review that, whether you are the Speaker of the House of Representatives or anybody else. You don't make those claims unless you have a larger legal agenda to trying to change the constitutional discourse to say, post 9-11, the president is everything, and Congress and the courts are nothing. Uh, and that's what I think makes these claims worrisome. The other observation I'd make in general about what many of the things Andy is saying is the gist of his, well, the Constitution really doesn't mean anything. That is, unlike Justice Jackson's opinion in West Virginia Board of Education, Barnett, saying the certain rights that we have are not subject to the outcome of any election, he's basically saying, well, there are political checks, because sure, if you're really a tyrant, ultimately you may lose power if you can't exert all your tyranny before you lose office. And that ought to be sufficient. But that's not why we have a constitution. If that were the rule, we wouldn't draft any constitution at all. We'd just leave it to the political realm. It's because we know human nature teaches us that there's likely to be excesses in the political dimension in certain times of strife. And that's why we try to tie down the powers of government irrespective of the outcome of elections, to preserve the long-going civil liberties that keep us a republic. Okay. Yes, in the back. Uh, Scott Rafferty. Uh, Mr. McCarthy, early in your remarks you spoke about the uh, absence of military tribunals and habeas corpus. As a little louder, please. Uh, as providing a reward for uh, people who propose to attack us, and you appeared to link it to the repetition of it's we not, can't hear you. It's not your fault. There's a fan here. I'm, uh, oh. uh, earlier in your remarks, uh, at the beginning of your remarks, you said that um, uh, the absence of military tribunals and the use of civilian um, uh, uh, forums and, and habeas corpus provided a reward to people who wanted to attack us and, and, and linked it to the repetition of, of terrorist incidents and 9-11. And uh, just what is the behavioral assumption there that that someone who is actually guilty is going to be incented to to uh, uh, attack the United States because of the procedural guarantees we have uh, and 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 how uh, is there empirical evidence for that and and do you do you believe that uh, by establishing the military tribunals you've you've reduced the um, the growth of al-qaeda and the uh, recruitment opportunities for it <clears throat> uh, I, I guess two things in response to that. First of all, I want to be understood as defending the military commissions as a, as a legal proposition. It's not what I would do if it was my, if I had my druthers. I think that we, we ought to, this is not a, this is not a war in the conventional sense that we've come to appreciate war. It's also not a criminal justice problem. But it seems to me that we have these two paradigms that we're familiar with in our history. There's a, you know, the military justice system way of doing things, and there's the civilian justice way of doing things. And what we've done is we've taken what's a novel problem and tried to pigeonhole it into one of these two familiar paradigms. For my money, I would prefer to see us um, try to take the best of both systems and, and meld them. And I think that not only makes legal sense, I think it makes practical sense because even if I think, and it really doesn't matter what I think, but if I think that the military commission system is perfectly appropriate under our Constitution, and I do, um, the fact remains that going forward, uh, we are probably going to apprehend people all over the world. and regardless of whether we think our military commission system stacks up with our law, the fact is that if people won't extradite terrorist suspects to it, then what have we accomplished? What we've basically done is outsourced our national security to people who have much less of an interest in it than we do. Um, to, to try to get back to what your question was, um, you know, number one, when you prosecute these cases in the criminal justice system, 
it is necessary in order to comport with our due process requirements in the criminal justice system to give a lot of intelligence that would be very useful um, to the enemy in wartime. Um, can I tell you, you know, empirically, we gave this piece of information and as a result they were able to carry out that attack? No. Uh, can I tell you that as a result of prosecuting them nine times over a course of eight years, that we gave them intelligence that uh, about what we think, what we know, what we don't know, that if Al-Qaeda on its, whatever its budget is, had its own Al-Qaeda CIA, that they'd never get anything close to that in terms of intelligence. I think that's absolutely true. Um, so you do, uh, I, I think, gravely risk the national security of the country by trying to prosecute these cases under the ordinary rules of the criminal justice system. Roger. I'm Roger Pilon with the Cato Institute. Uh, Bruce, uh, in your uh, opening remarks and your rejoinder, you said that Andy had focused on legal and technical distinctions and didn't show how statutes applied and just uh, didn't work. Well, I believe that he did, but I'll supplement that. As you know from the uh, in resealed case, the uh, appellate case from the FISA appeals court, uh, th there was a reference made to the uh, to the wall that er was erected between FBI and CIA counterintelligence. Uh, in her uh, congressional testimony, uh, former FBI agent Colleen Rowley from Minneapolis testified how she tried to get a, um, a warrant to look into uh, Musawi uh, and was uh, frustrated by the inability of DOJ to uh, press it with, uh, with the FISA court, uh, didn't think she had enough. In the Musawi trial, uh, the current FBI agent Harry Samet testified how he tried to get a warrant. Uh, this was nine days, I believe it was, before 9-11 uh, against one of the 9-11 hijackers and could not do so. Those are real-world consequences of a statute that many of us think is an effort by Congress to micromanage the conduct of foreign intelligence gathering and indeed, it's not uh, any accident, I submit, that Congress has not revisited uh, the FISA statute because, uh, for one thing, they would no sooner than revise it than the technical changes in telecommunications might make it uh, uh, obsolete as the current FISA statute is obsolete. This is one example of the, of the attempt to micromanage by Congress in an area that, in my judgment, is part of the Article II power of the executive. I think the question is largely counterfactual. First of all, as the Commission found, it wasn't FISA that was flawed. It was being misapplied uh, by those who didn't apply the language and law properly. Uh, secondly, FISA has been amended six times, six times since 9-11. And indeed, specifically the issue you raised of the wall, that specifically was addressed and torn down by change in the language of the statute. In fact, it was just moments after 9-11 happened with the Patriot Act that accomplished that. So I think that you're simply misdescribing history. Okay, we have time for uh, one more question. Yes, sir. I'm Gerald Schneider, and I'm representing myself. Uh, Mr. McCarthy, uh, Mr. Fine said that the fundamental role of government is to protect our freedom and you said it's to protect our safety. And while if I recall correctly, he used the word security, one of the major founders of this country, Benjamin Franklin, said people who would trade their freedom for security deserve neither. Was Benjamin Franklin wrong? Yeah, I think uh, there's no uh, a bumper sticker like that with, uh, with great reverence for Benjamin Franklin. Um, is one of those things, I think, like uh, Justice Holmes' uh, you know, marketplace of ideas. Um, it, it, it can become an excuse for thinking critically. Um, there are, a, one little bumper sticker like that, no matter how eloquent, uh, is not going to tell you uh, where the rubber meets the road, what choice to make in the very difficult uh, struggle that we have, which really is a tension um, between what we think of ourselves as, as an enlightened people, which is what's expressed in our civil liberties, and what we need to do to protect ourselves. And we have to go about that calculus, I think, mindful of the fact that 
what, what we do to protect ourselves is, is basically protecting a system that's the framework for all of our liberties, and our liberties are not worth the, the paper they're written on to the extent that they're documented uh, unless we're able to secure our people and, and secure the system that actually protects the liberties. Well, I think certainly the, a slogan like that doesn't resolve the hard line drawing that has to be done in any enlightened system of law. But it does capture the essence of the republic, which is the burden of proof is on those who need to demonstrate that security is in fact jeopardized unless you encroach on the liberty. And burden of proof is oftentimes decisive. If security was to be supreme, we wouldn't have a Fourth Amendment. Everybody recognizes the Fourth Amendment's purpose is to make it more difficult for government to prevent crime. It would be easier to say government can search, seize, break into our homes, listen to anything they want to listen to without any restraints whatsoever. And I come back, that's the fundamental test, in my judgment, of where we go from 9-11. Who has the burden of proof in this area where we don't have Euclidean geometry giving us clear answers? Who has the burden of proof of showing that this encroachment is justified? Do we assume everything's changed since 9-11? Anything that conceivably, at any time in any place, could help Al-Qaeda is something we can snuff out, even if it means secret trials, even if it means not giving defendants due process protections to know how to defend themselves? Or do we say, no, part of the legacy and meaning and signature of the United States is we do take some risks, not reckless ones, but some risks to live free, even if it means that we permit some savages abroad a little more leeway. I'm afraid we've run out of time, but would you please join me in thanking both of our speakers for a great debate. Thank you.